Okay, Ramon, welcome back. Uh, we have these discussions on the Russian Revolution. We went into the historical this, uh, development, uh, how to assess the Russian revolutions. We had differences of, of views and analysis uh, there. We developed it and we explored the different uh, 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 analytical uh, frameworks. Um, but uh, as you suggested, it's, let's go into the bigger picture uh, than the historical, which is how the theoretical construction of the Russian Revolution was framed at that time and how it became the philosophy that all communist parties across the world and socialist parties had to deal with, uh, um, which you call the paradigm. Let's say, uh, let's, let's look at um, how, they, how they looked at it. And then obviously, um, the theoretical framework of the Russian revolutionaries of all sorts, not, not only the Bolsheviks, you know, <clears throat> was very much framed by the European enlightenment. Uh, and it was uh, embedded in the history of socialist theories in Europe. That was the basic thing. And obviously, uh, the work of Marx uh, and Engels uh, on how capitalism uh, would develop in Europe, uh, the transition from feudalism to capitalism and how capitalism then creates the conditions for the socialist revolution because these conditions were dependent on a high level of development of the economy technology, um, uh, then uh, a, a, a social uh, division of labor where the peasantry basically was a small minority and the overwhelming majority of the population would be the wage earners, people who were forced to sell the labor to a small minority of capitalists who owned the means of production. <clears throat> and that the, the periodic economic crisis that were inherent in capitalism would then eventually produce the crisis where then a party on behalf of the working class could take power and transform the economy from a market economy into planned economy. Uh, uh, religion would die away and science from the enlightenment would be leading intellectual life. <clears throat> and then, um, uh, uh, basically, a lot of the, the things which Marx explained on the Paris Commune, the program of the Paris Commune, would, would then be fulfilled. But then the Russian Revolution was the first revolution to occur, and it didn't occur in a highly developed capitalist country. Russia had at that time, what, about 160 million people, about 10 million workers, a lot of them uh, the majority of the population were, were peasants who just escaped feudalism a few decades ago. Uh, and that determined how the Russian discussed Marxism and, and, and the idea of revolution. So uh, the greatest contribution then that Lenin made in the uh, whole debate about Marxism was the concept of the Fengar party. So how do you organize a revolution? How does it come about? And Lenin then said, look, um, whether you are in a highly developed uh, capitalist country in Germany, or you are in Russia, or you are in Vietnam or China, wherever you are, what you need is a party of dedicated revolutionaries that have been trained to understand the logic of capitalism, trained to build the relationship with mass organizations and be prepared for that particular moment in history, uh, which will come uh, periodically and where then that party 
take state power through military action. Obviously, afterwards, you know, the whole debate about the Leninist uh, party uh, in China, we'll come to that at another time. Uh, the, 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 the guerrilla party, the guerrilla war was a different mechanism than the kind of uh, instant military takeover uh, like uh, in Russia and in the Cuban revolution, the, 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 the concept of the Fengar party was introduced after the revolution because before it, it was different. So the discussions that were there in the Russian revolutions were very important for the whole socialist movement. Um, and obviously there were many, many debates uh, about what this uh, Fengard party, how it would operate, uh, uh, the discussions between Rosa Luxemburg uh, and, and, and Lenin on how the uh, Fengard could become uh, dissociated with the masses and gets an own logic that would lead to dictatorship. You know, these are some of the critique of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, what was interesting, however, in the whole theoretical construct of the Russian Revolution and why it appealed in the first few years to many across the world <clears throat> was the idea that ordinary people could take control of their lives and transform uh, the oppressive state apparatus into an instrument that would liber liberate themselves. For example, um, women liberation, uh, LGTB rights in the uh, Russian revolution, they acknowledge gay marriage. Um, a lot of discussion on the new human, uh, 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 new woman, uh, the works of Alec Alexandra Kolontai, the discussion you know, among the Russian feminists about uh, uh, man -fe male female relations. Uh, there are many things there. I remember an anecdote uh, that um, uh, was told then about uh, a play in which uh, the revolutionary brought God to a tribunal and found him guilty of all the crimes that was created was was committed in the name of God and they sentenced him to death so they went outside and shot in the air uh, at God. I mean in terms of art and liberation there were many things going on during the Russian revolution which was an inspiration there for many people but theoretically it introduced the idea that practically with the concept of the Vanguard party it was possible to organize a successful revolution. And the idea of that society was basically based first initially on the Paris Commune, where the Soviets were modeled after representation of, 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 of uh, people in the certain districts and, and uh, uh, they would be able to the workers would be able to govern themselves. That, that idea was there in the Russian revolution. Obviously, when we discussed the historical development, we saw that a lot of things went wrong, you know, but it was not only because of history. And here it is where the discussion is, it's also because of theory, you know? Uh, and, 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 and that is where decolonial theory is reflecting now upon the legacy of the Russian Revolution, uh, but I've talked enough. We have a few, uh, a short time now, so I'll give you the floor and um, give, get your impressions. Yeah, um, thank you, Du. I think that uh, you gave a very good summary. I mean, and we you tie what you just said with the this previous discussions we have in the last two videos on the Russian Revolution. People can get an idea about. What was in the uh, you know what it, what was the paradigm more or less what was what were they uh, thinking about I think again that 
I, this is what I said the first day, uh, the first video on the Russian Revolution, that there is always, a, we need to distinguish the, um, the idea that the Russian Revolution contributed to, to circulate around the world and, from, and the image it had around the world from the reality. And these two things are, are separate and different. I'm saying this because at least during several decades of the 20th century, there was a gap there in which the ideas of, of, of a worker state, of workers ruling themselves, of getting rid of rich people, you know, controlling a country and so on, it was a very powerful idea, you know, because it, it stimulated utopian thinking everywhere around the world. So every, you know, people look at the Soviet Union without knowing the details of what was going on, but just looking at what they were saying publicly. And that inspired many people around the world and many revolutions. And that, that was a positive aspect of the Russian revolution that it, it brought kind of a, it unleashed the utopian thinking of people, it unleashed the the desires of workers, peasants, and oppressed people around around the world, you know, they uh, they also embrace an anti-imperialist critique, a critique to colonialism, a, a critique to the you know Western powers, and so on. That unleash a lot of revolutions and a lot of you know critical thinking and so on around the world. Now, uh, as we know, the the reality of the Russian Revolution got uh, rotten very early on in the revolution, as we discussed in the last two uh, conversations, and um, and so to you know later, let's say after Second World War, there was more of a correspondence between the the image and the ideals of the Soviet Union, because then what happened was that after Second World War. Uh, this, this, what I call state capitalist system was consolidated in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union became, in my opinion, another imperialist state in the world. It never managed to break from the Russian empire. I mean, it continued being the Russian empire with a different rhetoric, different face, but it was in a sense, uh, in my, in essence, uh, a another imperialist power competing for world markets and the control, the geopolitical military control of the world. So, and, and so that image, and then the, the 20th Congress of the Soviet Union, uh, where Khrushchev, that was one of the sons of Stalin. I mean, he was a Stalinist as Stalin himself start denouncing the crimes of Stalin and try to place it on an individual instead of placing it in a system. And, and that immediately got millions of people disillusioned with the Soviet Union. So immediately people start seeing the gap between the rhetoric and the reality. And so that created at a world scale, a lot of skepticism around the world about this project, okay? And the project of socialism of the 20th century. And, and this, I think that what we need to discuss in the next few videos is more of the, about the paradigm of that led to this kind of, of the vision of, 20th century socialism, okay, with its virtues and with its limits. And I think we should go in detail about the paradigm in the next videos. What I mean, mean by that is uh, we've been discussing a lot about the history, the, you know, the characterizations of the Soviet Union. We have debates about it. We disagree on some issues. And, and then but I think that where we agree more among ourselves is in the decolonial critique, that is the, the critique to the Eurocentrism that was at the center, at the core of the paradigm that led 20th century socialism. And I think this is where we should go 
in the next few videos, like go directly into the critique. Because I wanna hear from you more, you, I mean, you did not elaborate in your intervention here. I know you have a more elaborated critique, you know, in terms of liberalism, Marxism, all this stuff that you have criticized the alignment project, how the alignment project colonized both liberalism and Marxism and so on, you know? But I wanna say something before we finish. Mm -hmm. And I wanna save Marx from the Marxists, okay? And I'm saying this because there is a whole body of work of the last 20 years of his life of Marx that has been unpublished. So 20th century socialism were reading the published work of Marx, which was basically, you know, um, uh, most of it was um, centered in his early life, the young Marx, and later, you know, one volume of Capital, okay, one volume. Uh, and he has several uh, rewriting of Das Capital that haven't been published. And, and people, it's, it's unknown. It's an unknown Marx like Enrique Dussel loved to say. And Enrique Dussel is one of the few who has gone in detail into this. He has one of the few Marxists in the world, probably the only, is the only one recognized by all the Marxists that have read all of Marx, the published and unpublished manuscripts of Marx. And Marx himself at the end of his life was having second thoughts and had a critical view of many things he was writing about because he starts seeing the limits of his own thought in terms of how Western centric it was in terms of how Europe Eurocentric was. And he start revising things. And there are several um, notebooks of Marx and several, including uh, rewritings of Das Capital that are very relevant, very important that we haven't have access to. That just recently the Mega, which is this major um, um, library or, or archives in Berlin of all the works of Marx have begun to publish in German. But there were until very recent hundreds 40 volumes, something like that, that were not published. And, and then what happened was that Engels had access to one of the early, uh, early draft of Das Capital. And uh, he never had access to all the revisions that Marx did of those volumes later in his life. So the second volume and third volume of Das Capital that we read it's an early draft where that Engels had access to, and Engels tried to, to with those, those with this draft, try to systematize and, and interpret. So that's what we're reading. And, and then what, what happened was that then the Marx we, in a sense, we knew in the 20th century was filtered through Engels. And Engels as we all know with the anti during and scientific socialism and all this stuff, dialectical materialism, historical materialism, all, are, all of these are concepts that Marx never, never used, okay? Marx never used those concepts, okay? It's, it's shocking for many Marxists to say this because we've been so, you know, ingrained into a common sense that you know, dialectical materialism, historical materialism, scientific socialism, all this stuff, you know, he never used those terms. This was Engels, okay? And after Engels, 20th century socialism. And 20th, socialist, 20th century socialism, based on the reading of Engels or the interpretation of Engels of Marx, Engels became like the bridge to Lenin, to Stalin, to Trotsky, everybody. You know, and that's why you have a lot of problems in the paradigm itself that we need to um, decodif decodify. We need to do a decolonial critique to this, okay? Because 
if we want to move forward into the 21st century, into a radical transformation of the world, okay? And we want to rescue the spirit of those movements that try to transform the world, be that socialism, be that anti-imperialist movement, national liberation movement, we need to look critically at the problems, at the problems in the paradigm itself so that we can have a vision for the 21st century that is decolonial, that is decolonial in the sense that, that have gone through the work of looking at the problems of, that, of the paradigm that led to uh, the, what I will call the disaster of 20th century socialism because in the, it ended up, if you remember, with the workers uprising against the worker state, you know, and embracing neoliberal capitalism. Look at what happened in Eastern Europe. Look at what happened in, in the 90s in, in Russia. I mean, it was con completely bizarre, you know, seeing this, you know, because, and, and this in great measure, it's not just that the capitalist imperialist forces were there fighting against and, and were successful at beating up this other empire and so on. That's part of the story, but that's not the only part of the story. There is another part of the story that have to do with the mistakes, with the paradigm, uh, deep para paradigm problems under which this project was built that led to the disaster it led. Yeah. So well, I, I think the best entry into this discussion is um, what you mentioned, the 20th, uh, the 20th Party Congress and Khrushchev. Why? Because there was one guy in the French Communist Party who, based on the analysis of Khrushchev, then went into a deep critique from a decolonial perspective on Marxism, that's MC Serre, you see? So I think uh, we have we don't have much time anymore for, for this session, which was uh, very short because of our obligations. But next sessions, we'll take that as a stepping stone, the critique that uh, uh, MC Serre had on the Communist Party based in the context of Khrushchev and then move forward about what the differences are and how the critique even came to the essence of Marxism, as he saw it, which was the European civilization. So let's let's go uh, let's go on to that uh, 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 next time. Yeah, uh, let, let me for the audiences. Interesting what you just said. Dude. Let me say that the text you're referring to is the letter to Maurice Torres. Yes. Uh, is the letter where a messer, remember a messer is the teacher of Fanon, okay? An Afro-Caribbean, you know, intellectual, poet, cultural critic, historian uh, from Martinique, a, a colony of France in the Caribbean, who inspired many of the national liberation mov movements in Africa with the Negritude movement in, in Paris in the 1930s. Uh, and is, is one of the greatest figures of the 20th century. And so for those of you interested in this discussion, I invite you to read this letter to Maurice Torres uh, before our uh, next episode of this conversation. Uh, and I, I wanna say that uh, this, uh, this is a central um, critique that we need to tackle. Yeah. And this is a good beginning in our next conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye. So, just a second. Uh...